My name is Pastor Corey. I'm one of the pastors here at Kent Cove. It's uh, my joy to be with you this morning. Uh, today, our text comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, a very familiar passage beginning in verse 13. It reads like this, Now that same day, two of them were going from a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how, sl how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. This morning, we are going to be talking about the spiritual practice of walking. And as I was thinking about that, I, I realized that there are a ton of phrases or sayings in kind of our common vernacular about walking. So I thought it'd be fun to do a little bit, and I'm, I'm just going to set this up and say this is non-rhetorical, so participatory. I know that's hard for us sometimes but I'm asking an actual question, <laughs> right? What are some of those phrases? Like, I thought of uh, walk the line. I mean, who doesn't think of the man in black when you're talking about walking? Um, walk the talk, walking tall, some other ones. Walk in someone else's shoes. Walk, don't run. Walk of faith. Who can forget uh, Steven Tyler, walk this way, right? Any others? Walk your talk. Yes. So there are a lot of those types of phrases. And when we think about, when I think about the Gospels, one of the things that I always uh, am kind of struck by is how the whole story of the Gospels, of Jesus time with his disciples and his time on earth, how much of that story really takes place while they are walking somewhere, right? I mean, as Jesus traveled around, it's not like he was traveling, you know, uh, in a chariot or an Escalade or, you know, something like that. He, they were walking. That's how they got where they were going. Uh, 
The great church father Augustine said this in Latin, it is salvature ambulando. I'm sure I, I murdered that, but it means it is solved by walking. It is solved by walking. And I think there's a reason why there, you know, that, that walking gives us an invitation into conversation with God, with each other, and ourselves. And one of the reasons that the story that we just read from the Gospels is so striking to me is that it's such a great picture of the walk of faith, right? I mean, there's so many pieces of this. So the, this, these two disciples that are walking towards Emmaus, a couple of things that, that strike us about this story. The first is, is that they are walking away from Jerusalem, right? That should be noted. So as, as Jesus appears to them and they start describing that, you can almost hear the disappointment and disillusion in their voices as they talk about uh, what they had hoped, past tense, right? I mean, Jesus is gone, and they had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel, and as things kind of got real, they're walking away from Jerusalem. Now, you'll notice that after they meet Jesus, and Jesus uh, kind of opens the Scriptures to them, and they, they describe how their hearts burned within them, they turn around and walk back toward Jerusalem to go rejoin the disciples, right? And all of this, I think, strikes me that walking is such an important piece for us. And I'm not just necessarily talking about the idea of, um, you know, literal walking. Because the walking is a metaphor, right? We use it as a metaphor for faith. Barbara Brown Taylor, in her uh, great book, Altars in the World, on which we have loosely based this entire series that we're winding up today, says this about walking. She says, not everyone is able to walk, but most people can, which makes walking one of the most easily available spiritual practices of all. All it takes is the decision to walk with some awareness, both of who you are and what you are doing. Where you are going is not as important, however counterintuitive that may seem. To detach the walking from the destination is, in fact, one of the best ways to recognize the altars you are passing right by all the time. So as we walk, we begin to allow ourselves to be opened up to God's presence even where we don't recognize him. Right? So as we think about this story from the Gospel of Luke, as these two disciples walked and they were downloading their experiences with Jesus, right? I mean, can you imagine this? Having probably, I mean, we don't know specifically uh, how long these two particular disciples had been with Jesus, but clearly they'd been with him for a while. And so as they're walking towards Emmaus, I imagine they're doing what we all do when we experience some kind of loss or disappointment or challenge in life, right? They're walking towards Emmaus and they're kind of downloading their experience with one another. I imagine they're telling stories about, do you remember when Jesus did this, that, or the other thing. And they're talking about those things as they go along. And I think for us, that's an important reminder, right? I mean, we don't walk much in our culture. I mean, some of us hardly walk at all, right? And not because we can't, just because we don't. You know, I remember years ago, and this, this will date me, and I don't remember even the name of the movie, but there was a scene in the movie where uh, two characters, they're living in L.A., and they're going to go get coffee, and it's a half a block away. They get in their car, and they drive there, <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes we're like that. And I think what, what walking invites us into is to slow down and to allow God to show up in unexpected ways and in unexpected places. So I commend that to you. 
when we talk about the idea of uh, what Augustine said, that it is solved by walking, Barbara Brown Taylor again asks this question, what is it? Well, if you want to find out, she writes, then you will have to do your own walking. Sometimes we find ourselves stuck in our lives because we haven't slowed down enough to figure out what it is that needs to be figured out, right? And so this spiritual practice of walking can give us that space to figure out where it is that the Spirit is prompting us to do some work. But as I mentioned, walking is also a metaphor for the faith journey. In fact, it has been for millennia. And it is with good reason that we recognize that. If you look at the stories of Scripture, of course, set in the time they're set in, everybody walked everywhere. And so when you look at your concordance or you go into your Bible app and you search walking, you will find a lot of verses and stories that contain walking. Now, one of the oldest questions in our kind of tribe, the Evangelical Covenant Church, we used to be called the Mission Friends, and and when the Mission Friends started out, one of the questions they used to always ask each other when they gathered was this, how goes your walk? Now, of course, they said it in Swedish, so it sounded much nicer than that. But, how goes your walk? In other words, how's your relationship with God? Where are you at? Now, I don't know where you are at today in your walk. Maybe you're closing in on the end of your journey. Maybe you took a wrong turn. Maybe out of sheer exhaustion, you have just sat down by the side of the road and you can't take another step. Wherever you find yourself, it doesn't matter because we are invited to start anew each day. That's the beauty of our relationship with God. Now, As I was thinking about this image of walking and how we move forward in uh, our faith, I was reminded of a particular text, and it was uh, it's from the gospel or from the the prophet Isaiah, which is probably my favorite book in the Old Testament. Now, unfortunately, we heard an unfortunate and inappropriate use of a verse from that book this week from our president. But it brought to mind for me Isaiah and Israel and how fitting that book is for us now. Now, a couple of caveats before we get into this part. The first is this. One of the mistakes that that gets made sometimes in our context is that we take uh, especially texts uh, like ones from the book of Isaiah and we kind of Uh, superimpose America as the new Israel. America is not the new Israel, right? So when we read this, we're, we're not talking about American exceptionalism. We're talking about the people of God. We're talking about the new Israel, which is the church, the church universal, right? And so we can't take these texts and kind of superimpose them on American history. But It's fitting for us because if you know the history of the book of Isaiah, you know that Isaiah is a prophet who is brought, God has brought to speak both judgment and hope to Israel. Okay? And judgment was needed because Israel had wandered and lost their way. And um, Isaiah comes to pronounce judgment. And if you read especially the first um, 30 to 40 chapters of, is, of Isaiah, it, it's pretty sobering stuff because there's a lot of judgment. And it can be a little bit hard to plow through. But the reality is, is one of the things that we don't do well with in our faith walk is that to recognize that there is no hope without judgment. 
Okay? I mean, we like to, in our culture, oh, don't judge, don't bop, 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 you know, and there's room for conversation about that. But the reality is, in our spiritual lives, there is no hope without judgment. Because it is in judgment that God then pronounces the hope of Jesus. Right? And so, this portion that I'm going to read for you from Isaiah 30, the first part is Uh, Isaiah beginning to announce hope to Israel. Now, if you look at the the parts right before this, Israel, uh, he's announced judgment prior to this. And he's inviting Israel to to repent and to to turn to God. So this is what he says, um, chapter 30 of Isaiah. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses, therefore you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses, therefore your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. People of Zion, who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. Then you will desecrate your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. Friends, what I want you to hear this morning as we think about this idea of walking, of walking in faith, is to recognize that no matter where you find yourself in your journey, God is a God of mercy and compassion who is longing to come next to you, to come behind you, to show you the way. Here again the promise that he makes to Israel if they will simply turn to him in repentance. He says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, Your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. But how do we learn to hear that voice? How do we learn to hear the voice of God inviting us into that way of life? Well, friends, we've spent the last Um, I think it was 12 weeks, maybe 10, talking about spiritual practices. And the whole point of of this series has not been to give you more tools so that you can feel really good about your spiritual life, although that's great if they do. The point is, is to give you tools, ways to see and hear from God in your everyday life. Ways to see and hear from God that simply allow us and open us to hear that voice behind us, inviting us. This is the way. Walk in it. So whether it's pronouncing blessing and learning how to love those who drive you crazy, that's an invitation to walk in the way. Maybe it's that Uh, you know, rinsing out that mayonnaise jar and dropping it into the recycling bin because you recognize that the earth is the Lord and everything in it belongs to him and we're called to care for it. And so we recycle and it invites us to recognize and give thanks 
for all the good things that God gives to us. The air we breathe, the ground we walk on, the food we eat, the very creation all around us. Friends, these are all invitations into a way of life, a way of being human that honors God and centers God in our experience so that we might learn to hear that voice behind us and recognize it and find the invitation and the energy to stand up and put one foot in front of another for another day. And friends, I recognize we find ourselves in a season where it can seem impossible to simply stand up and put one foot in front of the other. So many of us are exhausted by the circumstances of life around us, whether we're uh, overwhelmed by the, the happenings in the world or whether it's more interior to our own life, challenges in our own family or our own, with our own health or whatever it might be. And friends, all that I can tell you is that God is right there in the midst of even the most mundane circumstances of life. And if you find yourself at a place where you simply can't get up off the side of the road, God will sit there with you until you are ready to take the next step. Now, I would invite you, as Peter already talked about this morning, um, small groups, life groups, are a way for you to find community. And if you don't have community, I encourage you to talk to Pastor Dan and to, to find community so that you can be surrounded, if you already aren't, by your brothers and sisters in Christ so that when you find yourself exhausted and overwhelmed, you have someone to walk alongside you or to simply join you on the side of the road for however long it takes. The whole point of this series, as I've mentioned, is to recognize that our whole lives are an invitation to live in relationship with God. Again, Barbara Brown Taylor writes this about spiritual practices. She says, The only promise they make is to teach those who engage them what those practitioners need to know about being human, about being human with other people, about being human in creation, about being human before God. Friends, the whole point of spiritual practices is not to achieve something. It's not to attain some higher level of consciousness or righteousness. Quite the opposite. If anything, it's an invitation into recognizing that we are all sinners in need of God's grace. And we're invited into this beautiful, mundane life where we can learn that even something as simple as recycling or blessing a neighbor or walking can be an invitation into life with God. The whole point is to learn to consistently hear the voice of the Spirit saying to you and to me and to the people of God everywhere, this is the way. Walk in it. Friends, it is my hope that through this series, you have found at least one new practice, one new way of connecting to God in your everyday life and being reminded of his love for you of his grace for you, of his invitation to live each day in light of that love and grace. Amen.